This is Rip the Fence. Call me Big Daddy. Presented by O'Reilly Auto Parts. Hi, Brandon. Yeah, you've been around. I got that. What happened out there? Also brought to you by Hercules Tires. Welcome to episode 102 of Rip the Fence. We This is the vacation version of RTF as, while we're both not in studio, we're on the road, but we have... Welcome in the voice of the All-Stars, Blake Anderson. What's up, Blake? How are you? Oh, just another day in paradise. A nice morning here sitting in the hotel room. It's, uh, it's vacation mode for me, too, just like you guys. Yeah, because you're not racing, right? The All-Stars are off? We are off this weekend, so I'm heading to my parents in Minneapolis, Minnesota. So in route, hit a race last night on my way, of course. So doing what we usually do. That's good. That's great. Um, so we want just wanted to get you on and you know tell your story. Obviously, you used to announce with USAC before I was there and before Dylan was there. Um, you now work for the All Stars and announce for with Tony, you know, for Tony. Um, so when when did you start announcing? Obviously, you were at Knoxville Raceway for a long time. When was your first announcing gig? I started in two thousand five, I think it was at Boone Speedway. So uh, a track in central Iowa that I grew up going to on Saturday nights, modified and stock cars. And uh, they have the IMCA Super Nationals. It's a home of IMCA. So they've got some pretty big races there in the fall. But uh, that's where I started. And uh, my dad kind of made me do it. It was one of those deals. I kind of got forced into it. And then did that for four years, three seasons. And a deal at Knoxville opened up my freshman year of college. So I went down there and Interviewed for that and got that and did that for a couple of years. Did USAC for a year in 2011 and then went back to Knoxville for two more years and then graduated college and moved to Charlotte and didn't announce for a couple of years. Just did a couple of pit report and stuff, uh, jobs for World Racing Group. And then uh, 2015, Tony bought the All-Stars and Roger Slack gave me a call and said, hey, you need to interview for this job. It's a little bit of everything. It's more than just announcing. So. I did. I met with my current boss now and a couple of times and ended up getting the job and moved to Indianapolis in the spring of 2015. And here we are, sixth season with the series, and we're uh, continuing to grow. Hmm. That's is a that, synopsis. Uh, it is. When you look back on your career, like the fact that your first really big job was at Knoxville, of all places, like that's pretty cool. Like that's, there's, there's a lot of people that, <laughs> would love the chance to announce at Knoxville just once. And that was like one of your, you know, your early gigs. Yeah, that was really cool. That was, I mean, I grew up 20 minutes from Knoxville, straight up the road in Newton where the Iowa Speedway is. So, I mean, I went to Knoxville occasionally growing up and ironically, my next door neighbor, he never missed a race at Knoxville and he's been to all 59 Knoxville nationals. So I grew up following sprint car racing, somewhat close not super close but uh, that was really neat that that was kind of my first big gig as you said Dylan and that really kind of propelled me to where I am now I met a lot of great people and that's where I made a lot of my connections that I've used throughout my announcing career the last decade to, to get where I am now and it's Knoxville's home for me now that's my favorite track that I get to and I go to Knoxville when I can and we race at Knoxville next week, so I'm super excited for that. And then I'll spend the next couple of weeks at Knoxville for the 360 Nationals and uh, I think what we're calling it the Capitani Classic this year. So the in place of Knoxville Nationals race. So I'll be there for a couple of weeks, and that's nice. I can go and hang out with friends and family and, and see some high school buddies and go 25 minutes up the road. But Knoxville is very special to me, and I, I do think it's cool, like you said, that that was kind of my first real big gig that I got to have in auto racing. You mentioned your neighbor had 59 straight Knoxville Nationals. Was your neighbor Tony Bacho? No, it was not. I, I do like the old joke there. I do like the old joke there because I'm not scared to give Tony one of those jokes. I wish I could say it was, though, so I could harass him more. <laughs> That's awesome. You obviously had the pleasure of working with Tony for a long time at Knoxville. Um, one of your catchphrases, if you will, that you have brought to, what, multiple series with USAC and All-Stars, um, you before the start of a race you know it better than i do i don't need to rehash it but you know it's showtime it it's showtime yeah. right it's, it's show clearly time. made it it's clearly made an impact on tyler <laughs> i've announced impact. with him before so <laughs> the last no that's so that came that's from, the beer <laughs> ironically that came from the guy that i was with last night that promotes at marshalltown that i've stopped to see toby cruz he'd always done that growing up and i thought man that just 
I always got so excited when he would go into that whole spiel. I said, I'm going to kind of, I told him, I said, I'm going to, he stopped announcing and just announces a couple races a year now. And I said, I'm going to, I'm going to take that and kind of use that. He said, yeah. So I don't know that growing up, that always got me so excited when he'd say here at whatever track we're at, it's showtime. So I said, ah, that'll, uh, I'll use that on the road and that'll be unique because we visit so many racetracks, whether it's with the all-stars or as you guys know, we, we went to quite a few tracks and we're with USAC too. That's right. Blake, something that I think is kind of interesting is that the year you announced for USAC, which was 2011, was the year that Larson kind of burst onto the scene. And I remember, because I was still racing, yeah. and I remember, like, he, whenever he was on the track, like, even as drivers, it was like, oh, Larson's running. Like, we got to, it was, you know, Larson's heat race is on the track. We got to go watch. It, he was just so, like, captivating. And now, and, and you had a front row seat for that. And now, you know, it, it's, this year hasn't, I wouldn't say has been, like, a rebirth of his career, but it almost, he has, like, the same pull now where, everybody wants to watch what he's doing and you've gotten to be kind of at the forefront of that too you know when he's come and run the all-stars and that sort of thing so uh I guess looking back you know it's been almost 10 years like is that kind of cool for you to look back and think you were there kind of when he first started and now it's like you know 10 years later he's you know tearing everything up again yeah, I think that's pretty neat you're exactly right I remember it it was like man there's this Larson kid from California and he was dominating out in California. He won the King of the West Championship. He picked up some Power Eye wins. And I remember the first time I saw him, it was at Do in Dodge City, Kansas. And he was tracking down BC. And BC swept the weekend. And Kyle got upside down, I think, the first night trying to track him down. And ran him hard the second night trying to get the win. But he was so impressive. And his first USAC win was Indiana Midget Week during uh, at Bloomington. I can remember that one. And that just, like, once he got that first win at Bloomington, it was game on the rest of the year, no matter what was racing, whether it was a wing sprint car, the non-wing sprint car when he won in Oskaloosa at the Ultimate Challenge, the midget, Silver Crown. I mean, I can remember seeing him on pavement for the first time at Indianapolis at IRP. Was yeah, like, that was the first place Whoa. I saw him, and I was amazed. Yeah. And Tracy Hines had an amazing battle there. Yeah, it was like he goes three wide with these guys for the lead on his one of his first pavement starts. It was insane. And we go to Milwaukee for the Silver Crown Series, and he never run a Silver Crown car in pavement. I think his fourth lap, he set the fastest lap of the day. It's like, geez, this kid, what, can, what can't he do? He just, he, every time he did something, and it's still this way, it still impresses me, but I'm like, man, what can he do to impress me more? And he finds ways to, to do it. It's incredible, and you're exactly right. He, he's doing that again this year. It's not, I think you put it best, it's not rebirth because – He's been doing it, but it's, he's just doing it more this year because obviously the opportunity to do it more has presented itself. But yeah. this year has been incredible too. I mean, it's just he's run 34 races the last six weeks, hasn't finished worse than sixth. His average finish is like 1.9. He's won 20 times. It's, it's crazy. It's incredible. Yeah, so the year you announced with USAC was the year that he won all the races at the four crown. Yeah. Um, which I think I was a freshman in college when I went there and saw that deal. And I was just like jaw wide open. I could not believe that just happened. Like it gives me chills just thinking about it right now. I could, can pretty much easily say that he is the best sprint car driver I've ever seen in my entire life. Are you the same way? Yeah. I, I mean, I, I mean, I didn't, I saw Steve throughout his career, but never really in it you know, when he was just absolutely dominating. Some, we'd see him at Knoxville Nationals when we go down and see that. He'd be in the A scramble on Friday night. Donnie is, I think Donnie often gets overlooked. I mean, what he did in 2015 when he won 31 outlaw races in 2015, I think is one of the most overlooked feats in sprint car racing history just because, as we know, there's so much parity now. Everything's so even with these drivers that – 31 wins is incredible, but what Larson's doing right now is, man, it's, I've never had a driver, like as Dylan said earlier, like where you just had to watch him every time he was on the racetrack, whether it was hot laps, time trials, heat race, dash, A, didn't matter. You're just captivated when he's on the racetrack. 
it's amazing to me too that he can do it in different cars. It doesn't matter what he gets in, whether it's a midget, a sprint car. I think he's going to do a non-wing sprint car, st- a little bit of non-wing stuff later in the year, and I'm sure that will be just as thrilling. He hasn't won a non-wing sprint car since I think it was Sprint Week 2012 when he ran Dutcher's car. Mm-hmm. And I imagine it'll take him just two laps to get back in the groove of things with a non-wing sprint car. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I. I I would put him right at the top. And I'm trying to set my bias aside because he's a close friend, but it's incredible. It's incredible. I can't think of another word. Incredible is just the word I find myself constantly saying when I talk about him. Huh. He's a really, really good race car driver. Um, so one of the things I wanted to do while having you on the podcast is get into some stories. Um, we had a in memoriam show for Dick Jordan who, uh, when he passed away, we told a bunch of stories. Pat Sullivan came on and told a bunch of stories. Oh. And I know you have a ton of Dick Jordan stories going up and down the road with um, the former public relations director for USAC, long time. One of the longest employees that USAC has ever had, uh, Dick Jordan, a really good guy. So what's your favorite Dirty Dick story? Oh, man. One, the one that I always find myself laughing about, and it popped up the other day on my Facebook memories, was I played golf with him one day. <laughs> no, you're talking like putt-putt, right? No, no, no. We're talking like – Regular golf. Regular golf. No. So I, uh, the putt-putt, that's – yeah, that's a whole other <laughs> – that's a whole other story. But we're playing regular golf, and he goes into the grass, and I'm – the grass is – this long grass that he hit it in is three feet tall. I mean, it's up to his waist. I'm like, Dick, just drop a ball, and we'll keep playing <laughs> Oh, no, DJ is going to go find it. You, you guys know DJ just as well as I do. He's bound and determined. Somehow he goes in there and he finds his, you know, amazingly finds his ball. If it was his real ball, we'll never know. I'm sure it wasn't. But he, he decides, I'm like, just pull the ball out of there. You can drop it in the, in the rough where no one's going to know. I don't care. No, DJ's in there. He's taking practice swings, and he's playing out of this grass that's three feet tall, and he decides, I'm going to play out of the grass. And grass is flying everywhere. It's like, a, <laughs> it's like a guy's got a chainsaw on there shooting this tall grass everywhere. I don't know why. Every time I think of that, I laugh. And every year that Facebook memory pops up, I laugh, because there's Dick Jordan standing in this grass playing out of it. It's up to his waist. Somehow he's able to find his ball. The putt-putt stories are great, too. I'm sure. Dylan, did you ever get to the putt-putt course? I never did, and I'm so sad about that. So Tyler, I you played. Did. Yes, I played putt putt with him once. Um, this is not the putt putt that you and I think of. So he was talking of it. This is like Dylan. This is like a mowed out course in someone's backyard. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's not like going to Pirates Cove or the local putt putt course. <laughs> so apparently, this is the way putt putt is actually supposed to be played. That's which, what he. That's what. He that's says. what he says. But basically. To put it into perspective, it is greens, like, okay, so it's like grass mostly on the course. Yeah. But then when you get to the green area, what would be a green of a, uh, like, golf, you know, golf, like, say the green, like, short grass, it's like sand. Like, you're putting on sand for the greens. Like, and that's, and that's apparently the, you know, that's the putt-putt, that's the true putt-putt way. I've never seen sand putt-putt before. And you get the the story the entire time on how this is real putt putt. This is the way it's meant to be played and not that commercial BS. And he was like the 63, 64 Indianapolis state city putt putt champion. That's correct. Yeah. <laughs> Apparently that's a thing. It's the place over there by the speed drum. And then we, yeah. get, ta- then we get tacos over there. I, I don't know the taco place, but it's pretty good actually. And then, uh, yeah, we go, we go back to the office, but, that was just lunch. I think we just went to we just play putt putt at lunch. <laughs> I, I, uh, I rode with him to Terre Haute one time. It was, I think it was the, one of the fall races, and he had to take me to Jungle Park. So I'm like, okay, yeah, I'll ride with you, Dick. We can go to Jungle Park. Well, you know, DJ, he shows up at the racetrack at hot laps. Yeah. Uh-huh. So I'm like, DJ, you know, we need to leave a little earlier because I got to be the racetrack because I got a little, you know, I need to walk around the pits and do a little bit of that. Okay. 
we get going and you know dj's got to make 12 stops on the way there's an antique mall okay great well there's a gas station where you can't not stop and buy scratch off tickets so we're doing that we swing by jungle park and it's 25 minutes before hot laps and Spridge is texting me like hey where the heck are you like you should have been here three hours ago i'm riding with dj well we roll in and dj backs into his normal spot there <laughs> right there by the tower right there by the tower <laughs> and i get out and sprint cars are on the racetrack i mean he gets me to the racetrack right at hot laps he didn't he's like oh what you're here for the races like, but dj i gotta work man so i literally get out of his car and walk up the tower and into the tower click a mic on and uh he's working on putting the driver list together he gets me there at hot laps time. I'm like, DJ, I got to be there at 2 o'clock. I can't roll in at 545. But he didn't find any problems with it. He was like, oh, hell, you're here. I got you here. Me and Spridge was mad at me that night. Oh, he was mad. <laughs> I love that. I always, you mentioned, you, well, I was going to say, you mentioned the antique mall, and I have been antiquing with him. That was an experience. Now, I say, it, it takes forever to get to the racetrack, but when you get in the antique mall, he can go through an entire antique mall with all the exhibits in five minutes. Oh, it's walk through and he out. can find every single racing memorabilia there is in the place. And if there's none, you leave immediately. Yep. That's it. What do you, you, you have to say, Dylan? You have a story? Well, I was just going to say, I, I shared an office when I worked there one summer with Richie and he would always come in and he'd, you know, he'd lean up on the door frame and just kind of stand there. Yeah, I can picture <laughs> Richie and I, Richie and I would be doing whatever we're doing. And, you know, one of us would finally, like, since he was there, be like, what are you doing, DJ? He's like, you guys want to go to AJ's? Always <laughs> Al Capuco Joe's downtown for lunch. You guys want to go to AJ's? Every, just, like, every other day. He'd just give that nod, too, just like, yep. AJ's? Yeah, AJ's. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, he would shave uh, on the way to the track, oh, or like, still yeah, he had shavings, uh, his hair <laughs> shavings in his car. I mean, <laughs> trust me, he was, the man was guy. the man was efficient. No, oh, he was. I remember I rode to him with to Milwaukee, and he got mad because on the way back from Milwaukee, we had a bunch of people ride back with him. I rode back with McCord, and some people rode back with him. And he got back, and he had his Ford Expedition because they were a sponsor of us at the time. And he threw the keys on Kevin Miller's desk and said, I'm done. I am not a bus. <laughs> Have your vehicle back. I'll drive my car to the races. I am not a bus. I'm like, DJ, you got a car for free. <laughs> and you're, you're mad because you had to give two officials a ride back to Indianapolis. He had this rant and rave that I am not a school bus. Have your keys back. <laughs> oh, he, man. Uh, they only made one Dick Jordan. In. Yeah, they did. Inevitably, at some point, we'll get a DJ book, and that'll be just a page turn. Like, and I hope Pat does it because Pat has yeah. so many great Dick Jordan stories of him getting off the plane, complain, going to Phoenix, complaining about a stomach ache the entire time, <laughs> rubbing his stomach. Oh, my stomach! He said they get <laughs> off the plane, and the first thing DJ says is Mexican. <laughs> <laughs> That's like. Even complain about a stomach ache for the last four hours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think Pat would be outstanding at writing that book, and he could go to a lot of drivers too. I mean, when they oh. uh, when they had the plaque, they put up the plaque at IMS for DJ for his years of service. Like so many race car drivers, all the Triple Crown drivers were there. Like, and Smoke, when he was on our podcast, talked about this just a relationship with DJ, and they would play night golf. They would take like putters yeah. out and put put uh, balls on tees and take putters and hit them as hard as they can and then go find them in the dark. Like he did cr some crazy stuff, but he just had good relationships with drivers that, you know, lasted a long time. And he was with USAC for a long time. I, another one of my favorite stories is Tyler, when you stayed at his place <laughs> and he wouldn't let you basement? leave the basement and well. there was only a urinal in the basement. <laughs> Yeah, he didn't have a shower. He did have a sink down there, but it was just no. a urinal. It was a urinal and a sink, and I would just, you know, I washed up with, you know, some soap and I got all the, you know, <laughs> cleaned all up. But that's a badass basement, though. It, he me, I mean, he taught me how to play craps. Uh, yeah, taught you know, me too. He, 
he <laughs> he like had a you know so many Tony Stewart stuff like everything that's ever been made of Tony Stewart is in that basement probably <laughs> I remember when I was at USAC he won like at Watkins Glen or something like that so DJ text him and said hey congratulations Tony texted him back the next day. So that next Monday in the office, DJ's walking around with his phone like, hey, Smoke text me. Like, <laughs> check this out. Smoke text me. Handing people his flip phone. He's flipping his phone open and trying to hand it to you. Like, oh, great. That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> oh, I miss that guy. I miss yeah. that guy so much. He's so good. So how many tracks have you announced that now? Do you have a count? I think I'm at 112 right now, something like that, in that neck of the woods. I can't remember. I, I had one next weekend when we go to Houston. I've been to Houston, but I've never announced there. But that's uh, that's going to be a big event, the grand reopening at Houston Speedway, 20000 to win for us. How many times have they had a grand reopening now? <laughs> That'd probably make at least three. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think they had, a, they had the grand reopening for Badlands. Yeah, then, which I was at. And then they had the grand reopening for Houston's when he renamed it Houston Speedway. And they had like one race. So yeah. I mean, this is at, at least number three. Yeah. 112 tracks. That is impressive. I, Dylan, do you have a list? Because I don't. Yeah, I've, I've been to like 119, but I haven't announced it all of those. That's just the number I've been to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I finally put that together. I was I had my list, and I went. I I mean, I was interested how many I was at. This was like last fall, so I started just highlighting them. And like, man, we're getting close to 100. And I hit 100 this spring, and then we did our little tour through the our Thunder Through the Plains deal, and that was nine races. And I was like, every one was a new one for me. So I was ra I racked them up this spring, which was pretty yeah. cool. So you got a podcast now that's on Flow Racing, um, and all of your guys' races are obviously on Flow Racing. Um, what's it been like to uh, start your own adventure there with a podcast? I mean, you guys know it's it's more work than what people think it is. It's you know, it's not just like you turn on things and go. There's a little bit of work involved with it, and I'm kind of getting my feet wet in it. You guys are 112, what 112 in? I think you said 102. This is 102. So 102, I think I'm 12 in. I was on quite the roll there for a while when we were in quarantine and then we got racing and then it gets got difficult because I was in hotels, hotel speeds weren't fast enough, didn't have time, flow's busy, I'm busy. So that got hectic, but I've done a couple of the last couple of weeks and hoping I can do one more here this next week and we'll see from there. But it's a lot of work. I mean, it's tough to find, as you guys know, it gets hard to find guests that, that can make it work and have accessibility to be able to get on zoom or vmix call like we use and can yeah. be free right when you need them to be and then finding background info on them and trying to go you know a half hour 45 minutes with a guy sometimes especially when they don't give the best answers i've had a couple like that that give real short answers and don't have many stories it's like it makes it hard to kind of build the story for them as you know so it's been fun though. It's an interesting challenge and I kind of enjoy it. It's something else to do. So I'm all for it. And flow has been great. They're uh, fun to work with and we're really growing with flow. I think we're 800 some odd races live on flow this year now with the acquisition of speed shift and just added a drag racing pay-per-view company. So that added more. Yeah. So they're busy. Anderson 410. Is that what the podcast is yep. called? Yep. Yep. I think we got 12 um, out now. You also, your voice is on a video game, too. Did you ever think that would happen? No. And boy, do my buddies love that. I can tell you that <laughs> much. Oh, man. Even my high school buddies that don't really follow racing, as soon as they found out about their, oh, we got to get this game. And I get texts all the time about the lines in that game. And we've got some more stuff coming this fall. And I'm like, oh, great. I had to record more lines. I said, Great. These are just more lines that I'm going to get texts from my buddies through midnight, you know, saying, hey, I heard you say this. Yeah, great. I appreciate you playing our game. Yeah. How did how did that work? Did they did they just give you a list of things to record or did you come they up with some of them on your own? Pretty much gave me a stack going of paper about that thick. And we went through it and it took a couple hours to get through. Just sat there and 
they mic'd me up and we sat in a recording studio and I read lines and read lines and read lines and read lines and read more lines. And I had a little bit of freedom to do some things that I want, but I pretty much, it was the first time I'd ever done it. So I was like, okay, I'm going to follow this by the book and do it. And my boss called me. He's like, hey, uh, we're doing this video game. We need you to get with this recording guy so you can record video game lines. What? And then, lo and behold, a month later, here's this video game and downloadable on Xbox. And it's weird. I play it occasionally. Like, I'll play it with my buddies. And Suave from Dirt on Dirt and Flow, he's got a points racing deal that we'll play. Like, Tyler Reddick will get on and really just kill all of us. <laughs> but I get on there, and it's weird starting the game up and hearing my voice, and then throughout the game hearing my voice. I usually end up muting it and to say I want to hear myself. But it's odd. It's cool. <laughs> I never thought I'd hear myself on Xbox and PlayStation, but here we are. 2020, man. 2020. COVID and all. Uh, yeah, so you, did they have to type out It's Showtime, like, really long for you? or No, no. That, uh, so <laughs> in the first go, I didn't even do it. And then – we did a second recording like, hey, you got to do it now. Like, okay, I'll do it for you. <laughs> it's hard to get it amped up sitting in a room with three guys and like, hey, you need to make this sound like this is like, can we just take it, pull audio? Yeah. No, no. So I'm in a room just yelling and it was odd. I you guys know it's hard. People are like, hey, can you announce for me? Like, it's no, yeah. it's hard to get excited right now. Like it's kind of one of those things in the moment for me, at least. Yep. I, I remember Jason Smith. Sugar uh, packets. I remember Jason <laughs> Smith from USAC would get so excited. Like he would come up to the booth just when you were about to do that because he wanted to hear it. <laughs> oh, he, and then like you, he, he'd be like, "You didn't time that one very well," or he'd be like, "Oh, you did a good job on that one," or like they just loved it. <laughs> he'd like, rate him. <laughs> he would rate him. Old Smitty. <laughs> International traveler. He, I, he was one of my favorite guys at USAC to just go in and talk with and sit down. I mean, DJ's at the top because you knew you were going to get a story out of it. Oh, yeah. And yeah. then you had Carl. Yeah. Who would just poke and jab at DJ and poke and just try to get <laughs> DJ fired up. And I miss, <laughs> I miss both those guys. The Carl young claims money, he, he the found young money a little came wing. from Carl, right? Yeah. Yep. He was like, hey, I dare you to call him young money. He's money every time he's on the racetrack. I don't have a problem with it. Sure. So I dropped it, and it stuck. And Carl took so much pride in that that he was the one that named him young money. Yeah. He had all these great shirt ideas, too, that, of course, none of them were PC, you know, politically correct. So, <laughs> And in, especially in this culture, you know, this day and age, none of them would be. He was like, why don't you do it, Kyle? A little sell. But Carl, unfortunately – that's not politically correct, and we can't do that. Carl oh, claims – he claimed to the day he died that he found a Lil Wayne CD in Dick Jordan's office. What? <laughs> yeah, he did. <laughs> that is I forgot news. about that. I he would bring that, that up all the time. Yeah. And then we had the Whip Wimbleberg. That was his yeah, great child. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, Dylan, so tells a, Dylan tells a story about going to – the Indy 500 and Carl was wearing a shirt that said something like about it was about Earnhardt's crash, right? Well, it yes. was a, yeah, it was a Sterling Marlin shirt that <laughs> said, "Who's the intimidator now?" Like right. it's, it's terrible, <laughs> just awful. Yeah, <laughs> that's Carl in a nutshell, though. God, yeah, he was another one like DJ, just one of a kind. And yeah, he's great. Boy, he would. Few, I enjoyed few things more in life than getting Carl worked up. Like yes. You could get him spun out in a snap of a finger. Oh God, he would get he would get so up on the chip that you just he just couldn't recover. No, oh he it would ruin his day. Yeah. You would go get him spun out and it would ruin his day. He'd come in your office. Why? Why? Why'd you do that? Why? <laughs> he asked I remember one of the Carl so I they flew me down to do what was twenty thirteen was the year you were there. Tyler mm -hmm. so you and I did Florida together and I had to share a room with Carl and Carl's like I'm in college Carl's like hey I got a condo shall I buy it I'm like sure Carl I don't know I I pay three hundred dollars a month in rent so my life's a little bit different right now <laughs> and he kept asking me shall I buy this condo and we're laying in bed it's like midnight and he's in the bed there and I'm in the next bed over 
He's like, what, well, what do you think I should do? Should I buy this condo? I'm like, yes, Carl, sure, buy it. Yeah, buy it. <laughs> and then two minutes later, so, so you think I should buy the condo? <laughs> yeah, sure. Well, what, what do you think I should do? <laughs> Finally, I had just had to fake like I was sleeping and stop responding. Sprint gets a <laughs> kick out of that. He kept, you know how Carl was. He would do that. He'd be like, hey, should I do it? Why, why are you doing this? He asked more questions than anyone I've ever met in my life. Was that the Jerkville USA year? That was the Jerkville USA day. Roll away USA. <laughs> uh, LL Cool James. Yep. <laughs> LL Cool James. <laughs> oh, man. That's great. Well, Blake, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me, guys. I, uh, I really enjoy it. It's been fun to watch you guys progress from episode one to now 102. I mean, you guys are professionals, so it's no surprise. I don't know about that. Yeah, that's, that's a you have to say, say that lightly. Professional. Well, I, I'm happy I get to call you guys two good friends. That's for sure. Yeah, yeah that's likewise, true. buddy. Well, thanks for calling in, man. Uh, I know it's what ten and ten thirty. It's a little early for us. Well, but... it's, yeah, it's nine thirty here. Oh yeah, nine thirty there. Yeah, um, it, it's good. It's good reason for me get up and I can hit the road and I'll be it to my parents earlier than I told them I would be, so they'll be presently surprised. Through that. All right. Thanks, Blake. Thanks for calling in. All right. See you guys. See ya. See you, buddy. Sir, are you aware you were going 40 miles an hour? This is a residential area. Sure, but I'm on my lawnmower. Wait, am I getting a ticket? No, I've just never seen anyone top nine miles an hour on one of those bad boys. And mow their entire lawn in 30 seconds? What got into you? Well, it did fuel up at Sunoco this morning. At Sunoco, we know how to fuel peak performance. We've been doing it for American Racing for over 50 years. Fuel your best. Citywide to countryside. Whatever you drive, wherever you go, Hercules Tires has the value, selection, and industry-leading warranty to get you there, no matter where the road takes you. Go to HerculesTire.com. There, you can find the nearest authorized Hercules retail location to you. Plus, you can use the tire tracker to find out which Hercules tire fits your vehicle the best. That's HerculesTire.com. Hercules Tires. Ride on our strength. Blake Anderson, everyone. Voice of the All-Stars. Uh, good friend of ours, Dylan. Obviously, he was talking about Ocala when we had, he and I announced together in 2013. And then he, uh, well, he was with USAC in 2011, and then for the past six years, he's been with the All-Stars, and he was also the voice of Knoxville Raceway with Tony Bacco. And so, good friend, good guy, and it was uh, fun to have him on and tell some stories about Dick Jordan and, and Carl. Everyone calls him Carl um, from USAC, but he was the director of the quarter midgets. At the time. Yeah, yeah, it was, uh, he was there for a, you know, a fun period of, of characters and uh, just great, you know, great announcer, obviously. And, you know, he's worked hard to, to get where he's at. And, uh, like you said, you know, proud to call him a friend. No doubt. Uh, pristineauction.com free $10. If you use the promo code RIP register with our own promo code with RIP on pristineauction.com, you get a free $10 where you can buy, uh, some of the coolest sports memorabilia or, um, they got music, they got movies, they got, you get anything you want on pristineauction.com. You can get a free $10 on the website using pristineauction.com, which pristine will be on your car. Uh, the midget going to Eastern, what do they call this thing now? Pennsylvania Midget Week or Eastern Midget Week, I think. Eastern yep. Midget Week, whatever, because they're probably racing one night not in Pennsylvania, aren't they? One night in New Jersey. Yep. One night in New Jersey. I racing's on the car, Sun Dollar Restoration. Um, what else is on there? Toyota. Toyota. You got some big time sponsors now on that car, man. Yeah, hopefully we don't suck. Yeah, that would be good. Uh, before we get out of here, well, we got six minutes left to go here. Um, I need to go, so let's wrap this up. O'Reilly Auto Parts, hat shake of the week. We've had one race during Sprint Week, and then we recorded. Who was your hat shake from Gas City? Um, probably CV just because I don't know how he saved that car when he, when KT and him ran into each other. I don't know how he kept it going. CV wins night number one of Indiana sprint week with Ryan Bolds at gas city. Mine's going to go to the throttle Shane Cottle 21st to seventh at gas city. Uh, putting the bottom like he always does in the old uh, Josh Hodges 74. So 21st to seventh, that is my hat shake presented by 
O'Reilly Auto Parts. All right, D. Welch, I'm going to get back to my vacation here. This hopefully will be posted this week. And it was a good show with Blake. That was fun. Enjoy your vacation. All right, buddy. Talk to you later. We'll see you guys next week.